Um, I would be in trouble for not wearing a tie. Uh, we ha- are having a baptism this morning, um, so that's where Brother Ben is. We'll have that in just a minute. Adam Hayden uh, will be baptized here shortly. Uh, hope you're able to grab a bulletin, as Brother Ben always says when you walked in. If not, there should be one around you on a pew. A few announcements. There's going to be a church security meeting uh, after the morning worship service. Uh, so if you'd like to volunteer for that, that's a great way to serve in the church on the security team. Uh, you can stay and you can let Adam or Mark Crawford know uh, if you'd like to serve in that way. Uh, today is the last day to sign up for church softball. We have church softball for all ages. Uh, we uh, have, there's t-ball, there's for, that's ages 6 and under. Younger youth is 7 to 11, middle youth uh, is 12 to 15, and then we have an adult which is 16 and older. Uh, so today's the deadline to sign up for that. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, it's looking like right now we're going to have a t-ball team for sure. Uh, if you're younger or middle youth, uh, really need you to sign up. We may have to pair up with another church or something. Um, so be sure you sign up uh, this morning. Children's church, there will not be any children's church next week because next week is Mother's Day. Uh, and there will also be muffins with mom that morning. I believe that uh, starts, I'm not sure the starting time, it's usually uh, like 9.30 to, or maybe it's 9 o'clock. I don't see Miss Heidi, so I don't know. But it, it usually starts before Sunday school and goes uh, through the service. Um, so see Miss Heidi if you want to know the time for that. Um, tonight we will continue. We've started back on Sunday nights. Uh, Brother Ben will be continuing his Sunday sermon series over the life of David, that's at 6 o'clock. And Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. It will be May 22nd through the 25th. There's a sign-up sheet for volunteers. Always need volunteers for Vacation Bible School. There's a way you can serve. Uh, there's all sorts of jobs, games, activities, uh, serving food. And, you know, you say, I don't want to teach. Well, there's other things uh, that you can definitely do to serve the church. And last announcement, um, June 20th through the 24th is Youth Camp. Uh, we still have the sign-up sheet back there. Uh, we're still taking volunteers. Anyone would like to go to help out, uh, sign up on those sheets back there. I've also I've made this announcement public to, to our youth, but you can invite, like, what's great about camp this year is you can invite as many friends as you want. So if your kid's like, I don't, I don't know anybody at church, we're, we don't go often, or, or you know, I just, not, they, they can bring, like, four friends, and now they know that there's four of them or five of them. So... Uh, Encourage your kids, encourage your grandkids, encourage your, uh, uh, our young people to go to church camp. And if you've never been to church camp, put that on your bucket list to go because it is life-changing uh, when you do go. But we're going to have baptismal service right now, so Brother Ben is going to come down from behind me, and uh, so we will start that right now. All right, we're glad each of you are here this morning. We've got Brother Adam uh, Hayden, and uh, we're thankful for Adam and and Alex and Oliver. And they came uh, down a few weeks ago, and uh, they've been talking to me, and then came down, made it public a few weeks ago about joining our church. And I talked to Brother Adam. He knew that he'd been saved. He did that time in his life that he put his faith and trust uh, in the Lord and uh, wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism and become part of our church. And we're, uh, we're thankful for him, thankful for his family. And uh, so we're going to baptize him this morning. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. You pray as I pray uh, that God will uh, bless him. Father, we're thankful for Adam, Lord, thankful uh, for his family. And we pray you'd bless him, Lord, be with this time of baptism. And uh, we just pray that in the days ahead that uh, you just be with him, help him to put you first. You bless his family and uh, use them for your glory. Use them uh, as they serve you through the kingdom. We're thankful for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith and under the authority of Farmington Baptist Church, I baptize thee, Adam Hayden, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. 
All right, we're thankful you're here. We're going to have a great day in the Lord's house uh, this morning. So, Brother Greg, you and the, Brother Matt and the praise team come and lead us in worship. Y'all will. All right, it's going to be a good service, isn't it? If you would, stand up with us and uh, join us as we uh, start to uh, sing praises to the Lord this morning. This is the day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made made that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. All right, you're starting out pretty good this morning. Let's uh, continue on with uh, In the Sweet By and By. There's a land that is fairer than day. By faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed And our spirit shall sorrow no more Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore To our bountiful Father above We will offer the tribute of praise For the glorious gift of His love And the blessings that hallow our days In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that Beautiful Amen. I tell you what, why don't we go to the uh, Lord in a word of prayer. Corey, would you lead us, please? Amen. 
Well, uh, Coy's uh, daughter, Hallie, sang this next song just the other day. Did a wonderful job singing it as a special. We're going to try it as a group, so we want you to help us out. Hallie, you sing nice and loud, too, okay? So you can, you can help us. Goodness of God. Miss Francis is here. They just had a big surprise birthday party yesterday. Is she turned 80? 90, isn't it? I'm just kidding. Yeah, she turned 90. So if you hadn't said a, a happy birthday to Miss Francis, make sure you uh, say something to her after church. As a matter of fact, uh, Thomas, Thomas Warren is going to sing one of her favorite songs for this morning, and uh, God on the Mountain. All right, we're going to finish up uh, this morning with a song called Holy Spirit. So help us out on this one. There's nothing worth for that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living home. Your presence, Lord. I take 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare your our living home your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let us become experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen. All right, you can finally be seated now. Thanks. Good morning. I'm going to sing God on the Mountain. Miss Frances asked me to sing this for her, so this is for her. I'm good to see Brother Willis here this morning, too. <clears throat> Life 
life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known but then things change and you're down in the valley don't lose faith for you're never alone for the god on the mountain is still god in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the god of the good times is still god in the bad times the god of the day is still god in the night you talk of faith when you're up on the mountain oh but the talk comes easy when life's at its best but it's down in the valley of trials and temptations that's when faith is really put to the test for the god on the mountain is still god in the valley when things go wrong he'll make them right and the god of the good times is still god in the bad times God of the day is still God in the night. The God of the day is still God in the Amen. We appreciate Brother Thomas singing for the Lord. That's a, a great song that still holds up. Uh, God is with us on the mountain and in the valley as well. We're thankful for that. We're going to be in the book of Acts today. Acts chapter number 18, my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Early Church. Acts chapter number 18. We're going to look at verses 4 and verse number 5. And I want us to think about this thought. Why tell people about Jesus. Why tell people about Jesus? Acts chapter number 18, and uh, we're going to be reading verses 4 and verse number 5. Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible here is speaking above the Apostle Paul. It says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit. And I like the last sentence there in verse 5. It says, and he testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time for us to gather together. Lord, we've had a baptism. Lord, we've had good worship and fellowship. And now we pray, Father, that the preaching of the Word of God, your, the, the Word is true, it's inspired, and I pray it would speak to each and every one of us. Lord, forgive us of our sins. We don't want to grieve your Spirit. We pray the Holy Spirit would be in our midst. And Lord, encourage us all through the Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why tell people about Jesus? Uh, here in uh, Acts chapter 18, we've got the beginnings of the church at Corinth. This is the, uh, the group of people the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians is going to be written to. This is how the church at Corinth was started. And it kind of got off to a rocky start. 
But I want to look at the, the story, and, and I preached on this, uh, this passage many times, but this is a new sermon. It's one of my favorite passages to see here in Acts as uh, the church at Corinth was started. And, and I want us to see uh, here what's going on in the story. If you're taking notes, I'll give you three R's. I want you to see, uh, number one, Jesus, He is the remedy. Three R's. Number one, Jesus is the remedy. I want you to see number two, it's our responsibility, all of us, it's our responsibility to tell others about Jesus. He's the remedy. It's our responsibility. And then I want you to see the reactions when we tell people about Jesus. So uh, the remedy, our responsibility, and the reactions. Paul was telling folks about Jesus, and I want to tell you in the 21st century, West Kentucky is full of people that we need to tell about Jesus. Let's look at it and, and see some things this morning. I like, first of all, in the remedy, the last part, you ought to underline that it says, Paul testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. This is the motto of Paul's message. Matter of fact, if you look on the opposite page in chapter 17, verse 3, you see the very same thing. Paul's in Thessalonica, and it says there in Acts 17, verse 3, the last sentence, it said, This Jesus who I preach unto you is Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he said, This same Jesus who you crucified is both Lord and Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. We say Jesus Christ. That's not his last name. It's who he is. It's the Old Testament, the Hebrew word Messiah. And it's the Greek word Christ. Jesus is that Old Testament deliverer. You see, as you read through the Old Testament, from the very beginning, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, over and over and over, God said, somebody's coming to fix this problem. Adam and Eve made a mess. We talked about that last week, how the world was plunged into sin because Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, God has told us there's, there's a deliverer, there's a Messiah, there's a Savior, there's a Christ coming, and He's going to fix Adam's problem. He's going to fix the problem of sin. There's somebody coming. And, and over and over the Bible says, as wise as Solomon was, He's going to be wiser than Solomon. As strong as Samson was, He's going to be a greater champion than Samson. As great as a lawgiver as Moses was, He's going to be a greater than Moses. As great of a king as David was, he's going to be greater. He's going to come in the spirit and the power of Elijah and Elijah, the greatest of the prophets. There's one coming, a deliverer, a savior, a Messiah, the Christ. Jesus. And so Paul is here and he's preaching to these, these Jewish people. They know about this. They know the Old Testament. They've been in Sunday school their whole life. And he says, listen, you know the Old Testament talks about that Christ figure, that Messiah figure. I'm here to tell you, Jesus of Nazareth, He is the Christ. He is the Savior. He is that promised one the Old Testament talked about. And I want to tell you, you and I, our message hasn't changed down through the ages, has it? Today, we tell men and women, boys and girls, listen, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Savior. He's the only one who can be the remedy for sin. He's the only one that can fix the problem. Jesus is the solution. You know, sometimes we'll see bumper stickers and we'll see slogans and people post things on social media and they're, they're good and I like them and sometimes I do and We'll post slogans like, Jesus saves. And that's a great thing to have. Jesus saves. But you ever thought to ask yourself, what's he saved from? Jesus saves, yes, but what's he saved from? Or sometimes we'll say, well, Jesus is the answer. And that's true. Jesus is the answer. But what's the question? If Jesus is the answer... What's the question? What does Jesus say from? The, the, the thing Jesus says from, the question, it's all about sin. What are you going to do with your sin? Jesus saves. He saves from sin. You see, the Bible says over and over, there is none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. All have sinned. A-L, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. Everybody except for Jesus is a sinner. What are we going to do about the sin problem? And I'm here to tell you, baptism doesn't wash it away. Communion won't take it away. Coming to church won't get rid of your sin. Being a good person, putting money in the offering box or the offering plate, none of those things will take care of sin. 
But do you remember? You ought to write it in the margin. Right there beside this uh, verse, uh, verse 5. Do you remember what Joseph was told? The stepfather of Jesus, Matthew 1 and verse 21. The, the angel said to Joseph in Matthew 1, 21. Talked about Mary. It said, she shall bring forth a son. And he shall save his people from their sins. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is the remedy. He is the Christ. He lived a perfect life. Satan tried to get him to mess up all the time. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died on that cross, not for his own sin. He had no sin. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. He died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And the whole purpose of that, what are we going to do about sin? We can't wash it away. We can't work it away. A person can't just turn over a new leaf and try real hard. It won't go away. What are we going to do about sin? And Jesus said, I tell you what we're going to do about sin. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to die on the cross. And just like we sing the song, Jesus paid it all. He said, I'm going to die on that cross. And I'm going to die for the sins of the whole world. I'm going to die for their sin and pay the price. Jesus is the remedy. But then look what it says. We see here, he says, Jesus is Christ. Paul's telling those folks that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one, the only one who can take away our sin. But the Bible is a book, it's, it's like a whale that never goes dry. There's so much good stuff in it. Not only we see the remedy, but there in verse 5 we see the responsibility. Now I think it's interesting, you look, who is all doing this? Well the emphasis is on Paul, but notice the first part of verse 5. It says, and when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia. If you go up a couple of verses to verse 2, it says there was a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Who's doing all of this work? Who's telling folks about Jesus? Well, Paul's doing it. But you notice Paul's got people with him. Timothy's with him. Silas is with him. Aquila's with him. Priscilla's with him. Luke is the man who's recording this. Dr. Luke, the beloved physician. Luke is with him. There may have been others with him. You see, Paul was never alone. We never serve the Lord by ourselves. The Bible doesn't teach a lone ranger Christianity. We always serve the Lord together. And it's amazing as you read the life of Paul, Paul is never by himself. In the first missionary journey, he's got Barnabas with him, and he's got John, John Mark. The later on after this, Paul's got, you know, Epaphras and Titus and Onesimus. He's got women like Julia and Phoebe. There's all these people that are with him, serving the Lord alongside of him. We never serve the Lord by ourselves. What the scripture, I think, is telling us here, Paul's there, but he's got Silas and Timothy, Aquila and Priscilla and Luke. It's all of our responsibility to tell people about Jesus. You see, so often we'll say, well, that's the preacher's job to tell folks about Jesus. That's the pastor's job. That's the Sunday school teacher's job. But no, the Bible tells us it's every one of our jobs to tell folks about Jesus. I was just this week reminded, I was talking to a friend of mine from back home in Logan County, uh, Brother Teddy Harper. And I was talking to, uh, uh, to Teddy, and we were at a meeting. We were sitting down fellowship and afterwards, and Teddy was telling me how his dad got saved just a few years ago. His dad passed away. It's not long after that. And he was telling me about his dad, and I told him, I said, I'm going to use that. Man, that was awesome. And I wish I could remember all the details, but he was telling me how his dad, Ray, was in a nursing home back there probably in Logan County somewhere. And his dad had never been saved. His mom was faithful in church, Brother Teddy said. But his dad, Ray Harper, didn't know the Lord. Ray had been a veteran, retired carpenter, good man, didn't know Jesus. He was in the nursing home, and you know how folks are sometimes when they're in a nursing home, they have good days and bad days. And sometimes Ray couldn't remember very much at all. But some days he was just as sharp as he'd ever been. And one day he was in there and he was having a good day, and there was a lady from the neighborhood, not a preacher, not a pastor, just somebody who was up there visiting somebody in her family. And she was up there and this lady had grew up right down the road from Ray. And she saw Ray and she said, hey, Mr. Ray, how you doing? Mr. Harper, you doing all right? And she, she went over there to say something to him and God had been dealing with Ray. And Ray looked up at her and said, well, called her by name and said, you know, I, don't you think I'm a good person? 
And she said, yeah, Ray, you are. You're one of the finest men I've ever known. Man, everybody loves you. You've been a good father. You've been a good husband. You, you are a good soldier. You are a good worker. Yes, Ray, you're one of the finest men that I've ever known. But this lady was a Christian. But then she looked at Ray and she said, but Ray, being good won't get you to heaven. Being a good person, that's not good enough to take you to heaven. And right there in the nursing home, Ray was having a good day. His mind was clear. That lady led Ray to the Lord. He got saved. Before he died. Aren't you glad? And boy, Teddy said, I'm just so thrilled that this neighbor lady, again, not the pastor, not a preacher, but a lady at the nursing home that was up there, not even a worker, just up there visiting somebody, told Teddy's dad, Ray, about the Lord, and he got saved. I want to tell you, God gives us all opportunities, and all of us have the responsibility. Let me tell you, if you want to write a verse down for this one, uh, we see it again with, with Paul and Silas and Timothy, but the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20, it says, all we, all we are ambassadors for Christ. We are all ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Paul says, we. Not just I, not just us, but he says we right into the church. Remember how Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Ye, plural, we say y'all, y'all, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the salt of the earth. I'm going to tell you, that's not just a select few. Every one of us that are saved, God has called every believer to be the light of the world. God has called every believer to be the salt of the earth. God has called all of us that are saved to be ambassadors for Jesus. How many folks? are there that you rub shoulders with you go to school with them you work with them they're all around us people that don't know the Lord people that aren't saved and they're all we again we're around them all the time and they're searching they're looking where can I find peace where can I find joy where can I find some purpose to this meaningless life I live and you and I we know the answer the remedy the only solution the only thing that will stand the test of time is Jesus it's all of our responsibility to tell folks about the Lord. It doesn't be weird doing it, but if you'll watch, if you'll have ears to hear, eyes to see, as you go through your life, just like that lady at the nursing home, God will give you opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. God will place people in your life that you rub shoulders with, and they're searching, they're looking for answers. And you know where the answer is. You know where the truth, the way, the truth, and the life is. You can point them to Jesus. So we see here in Acts 18, we see the remedy. Jesus is the remedy. He's the Christ, the only one who takes sin away. It's all of responsibility. And Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, Aquila, Priscilla, Paul's always got people with him together serving the Lord. God works through churches, through believers gathered together in local churches. Then last of all, notice the reaction. Now I want to dwell not on the negative but the positive. Let's try to be optimistic. But it's interesting what happens. So we see the reaction. Some rejected, but some received. So you notice verse 6. It says, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed. The idea of opposed, you may have a footnote in your Bible, they resisted. Now I wish I could tell you. Every time you tell somebody about Jesus, they're going to get saved right then and there. That's not how it works, is it? Sometimes you'll tell folks about Jesus and they'll say, well, you know, that, that's, that's all right. And, you know, that, that works for you, but that's just, that doesn't work for me. They'll just say no. Sometimes they'll say, well, you know, you're right. Yeah, I, I need to do that. I'm going to do it later. I've got some things going on in my life. When, when I get a little older, when things slow down, then I'll take care of the, my relationship with Jesus. I, I'm going to do it later, just not right now. Sometimes people even get hostile. Sometimes people get upset. I'm not interested in your Jesus. I don't believe your Bible. I don't believe Jesus was the Christ. And they get angry. Sometimes those people are the most angry. God's dealing with them the most. Sometimes they express it and they get, they get frustrated, they get mad when you try to tell them. People react in different ways. Jesus, you remember, gave the parable of the, the souls. And he said, when you tell folks about Jesus, sometimes the, the seed, it falls on the hard ground and the birds eat it. And sometimes we tell about people about Jesus and they got hard hearts. Sometimes we tell folks about Jesus. Jesus said, sometimes you scatter the seed and it falls among the thorns. The briars and the thistles choke it out. Sometimes you tell folks about Jesus and 
they're so distracted by what's going on in the world, they don't really listen. Jesus said sometimes it falls among the rocks and it doesn't, it doesn't go deep enough. Sometimes people really don't understand. But Jesus said sometimes it falls in the good ground. It falls in the good dirt and it grows and produces a harvest. So here's the thing. You read verse 5 there and verse 6 and you come down there in verse, verse 6 and you say, man, that's the reaction. Some of them got mad. But you just keep reading because you come down to verse 7 and 8. But some of them didn't. You see in verse 7 it says, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And verse 8 says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And I've told you many times, circle that word many, right in front of verse, in the middle of verse 8. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed. And then they got baptized. You see, not everybody's going to say no to Jesus. God has promised us. You've heard preachers quote this verse your whole life. It's in Isaiah 55 verse 11 where the prophet Isaiah said, God has promised us that His word shall not return unto me void. God has made us a promise. His word comes with a power, the built-in power of God. And when a preacher, an evangelist, a Christian preaches, teaches, shares the word of God one-on-one, there's the power of God built into it. And not everybody's going to get saved, but power is built into it. Some of them will. Paul told folks about Jesus. Some of them resisted, some of them opposed, some of them got mad and even blasphemed the name of Jesus. But the Bible says many Many of them didn't. You never know when God is dealing with people and He's just waiting on you to come tell them about Jesus. This week, it's amazing how things work out. Miss Maxine passed away, one of our sweet members, wasn't able, hadn't been able to come for several years. Every time I'd see her, she talked about how much she loved the people of this church. Loved this church, and we'd talk about many of you and how she loved you. And I saw Miss Maxine this week in the hospital on Monday. I was talking to her and and she was telling me, and she told me this before, she was going into great detail, and maybe she knew she was going to get to see him before too long. She was telling me about her husband, Avery. I never got to know Avery. They were married 52 years. But she was telling me about her husband, Avery, and she said, Ben, he was a good, good man, good husband, and uh, just a good fella. Didn't know the Lord. Didn't know Jesus. And every Sunday, Maxine would get up and go to church and go by herself. One day, Brother Howard Miller came by to see Brother Avery, Miss Barbara and Brother Jerry's daddy. Brother Howard came by and talked to Avery about the Lord, and Avery got saved. Got in church, served the Lord the rest of his life. There's people all around us. God's dealing with them, and the Lord is just waiting. Who will be the person to point them? To Jesus. How does a folk person get saved? They get saved by believing. That's how we get saved. By accepting Jesus. Everybody gets saved the same way. By saying yes to Jesus. We come to that point where we realize, I know that I've sinned. I've made a mess of my life. But I believe in my heart that Jesus is the answer. I believe that Jesus is the remedy. I believe He lived, He died, and He rose again. And I want Jesus to save me. And we cry out to Jesus. We ask Him to save us. And when we do that, that's how a person is saved. So the question this morning, you that are saved, the people you're rubbing shoulders with, the people you know at work, at school, your kinfolks, will you tell them about the Lord? Will you point them to Jesus? That's what they're looking for. If you've never been saved, how's a person get saved? By believing, by trusting Jesus, by saying yes Crying out to Jesus, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved. And if you'll cry out to Jesus, you can be saved today. And then we see just what we did here today. Baptism doesn't save us, but once you get saved, what's God's plan? We do all things decently and in order. What's the order we see in the scriptures? Salvation first, then we get baptized, we get in a New Testament church, and we serve the Lord. So maybe you're here and you've been saved. Preacher, I know that I've been saved. You've never followed the Lord in scriptural baptism. Never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Maybe you're not a member of this church. Man, we serve the Lord together. We come together as a local body of baptized believers. Putting Jesus first, our head, and we serve the Lord together.
Christian, you point people to Jesus. You tell people about the Lord. You know, I'm going to pray and we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you've never been saved today, and God spoke to your heart, just like old Ray Harper did, just like Avery Chapman did, just like I did, and many of us in this room did, you can be saved today by saying yes to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord.